difference was seeing the baby alive. Seeing, I was used to seeing the baby dead, right? Um, I was used to seeing it as just a thing, right? Not as a person. But to see on the ultrasound, to see this baby's heart beating, to see the instruments going toward its body, to see that heartbeat increasing, right? The heartbeat's beating faster. I can see that. And I can almost in that moment feel the panic Mm. that that child had to have been feeling. Women are currently being erased in culture, and I want to amplify their voices and share their stories. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to This is a Woman podcast. Today, we have Abby Johnson here, and I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with Abby Johnson and her story, and we dive into some great information about what is going on in Planned Parenthood, her experience while she was working there. But just in case if you're not familiar with who Abby Johnson is, Abby Johnson, she is now working in the pro-life movement, but that wasn't always the case She actually served and worked eight years at Planned Parenthood, where she quickly rose through the organization's ranks and even became a clinic director. However, Abby became increasingly disturbed by what she witnessed. Abortion was a product Planned Parenthood was selling, not an unfortunate necessity they were finding to decrease, which Abby thought that was the case when she started working there. Still, Abby loved the woman that entered the clinic and her coworkers, despite a growing unrest within her. And she stayed on and strove to serve women in crisis. But all of that changed on September 26th, 2009, when Abby was asked to assist with an ultrasound-guided abortion. She watched in horror as a 13-week baby fought for and ultimately lost its life at the hand of the abortionist. At that moment, she fully realized what abortion actually was and what she had dedicated her life to. As it washed over Abby, a dramatic transformation had occurred, desperate and confused. Abby sought help from a local pro-life group, and she swore that she would begin to advocate for life in the womb and expose abortion for what it truly is. So that's a little bit about Abby's story while she was there. And now, like I have said, today she travels across the globe sharing her story, educating the public on pro-life issues, advocating for the unborn, and reaching out to abortion clinic staff who still work in the industry. She is the founder of And Then There Were None, a ministry designed to assist abortion clinics workers in transitioning out of the industry. Since 2012, this ministry has helped over 700 workers leave the abortion industry. In 2019, Abby also founded Pro-Love Ministries, an umbrella organization to house pro-life projects and affiliations that fill gaps in the pro-life movement. Abby lives in Texas with her husband and eight precious children. So I'm so excited for you guys to all hear this episode with Abby. So with that, let's dive right in. Hello, Abby. We are so excited to have you on This is a Woman podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. So the listeners, they kind of heard your intro. I'm sure many of them are already familiar with you and your story, but you are just absolutely a trailblazer in the pro-life movement right now, just changing the world for life. But that wasn't your whole story. That's not where it started. And you did spend time at Planned Parenthood. You were the clinic director at one of the largest Planned Parenthoods. And it's 2024. Women still are believing this lie that abortion is good for them. It's a woman's right. It's healthcare. And that Planned Parenthood is pro-women. Can we dive into, is Planned Parenthood pro-woman? So Planned Parenthood is essentially Mm pro-hedonism. So they are, um, they are for anything that is going to break down culture and particularly break down the family. And so Uh, you know, I didn't know that when I first got involved, of course, I didn't, I wouldn't have gotten involved in an organization that just kind of said that out front. Right. But they don't say it out front. Well, and 
even when I went to work there, uh, there was still such a focus on like prevention. We're trying to prevent abortions, prevent abortions. We're going to give birth control, birth control. But, you know, it's been 15 years since I've worked at Planned Parenthood. And in the past, I would say 20 years, um, there's, there's been such a shift, I guess, uh, between prevention and just coming out right and saying, we are an abortion clinic. We love abortion. We're proud of abortion. We're very brazen about it. And we think abortion should be available for everyone at any time. No barriers to access, you know, taxpayer funded, whatever it is, they believe in just complete access, which was really not the way it was. Um, I mean, they always believed that, but they weren't so brazen about it as they are now. I mean, when I worked at Planned Parenthood, people were not walking around wearing shirts that said I had an abortion. Mm-hmm. Um, that just didn't happen. Uh, they were just, they were more quiet about their sinfulness. But now we live in a society where people are very proud of their sin. And so they want to expose their sin publicly because when we are sinful in today's society, we get accolades for promoting our sinful nature. And so um, Planned Parenthood definitely wants the accolades. They want the money. Um, But it's something so much darker than that. There's such a spiritual component to it as well. Um, You know, that they are proudly in the business of sacrificing children, sacrificing innocent children. There's something just at the heart of that that is so evil and so demonic and and like Old Testament sort of demonic, right? That we're still doing the same things as human beings that people were doing in the Old Testament in those times where they were, you know, uh, sacrificing their babies to Molech and Baal for whatever, right? For crops, for rain, for success. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what we're doing today in our society as well with the unborn. We're sacrificing them for the same thing, for careers, for education, for money, um, you know, for advancement, for success. And it's the same thing. It's just called something more palatable. We call it choice. We call it reproductive health. We call it termination of a pregnancy, but at the end of the day, it's, it's human sacrifice. Absolutely. And you touching on this is a spiritual battle. I think anyone that's in the life movement knows this is a battle of good versus evil. And there is um, that spiritual level to it. While you were at Planned Parenthood, um, just from reading your book and hearing your story, you've touched on, you actually started getting involved in going to church um, and making worship a part of your life with um, you and Doug, your husband. And did, because you began getting involved in that, did you experience um, spiritual warfare while you were working at Planned Parenthood? Or was it something you didn't even recognize that was going on until you left? I don't really think I recognize. I mean, I, I was raised in church, so I knew that every Sunday, I mean, I would say even in college, like even if I went out and got drunk Saturday night, I knew that on Sunday I needed to be in church. Mm-hmm. So I was just kind of raised with this, like you go to church every week mentality. And so um, I would be in church. And so when I started working for Planned Parenthood, I was raised Baptist, so I was going to a Baptist church there in in that area. And I I I don't I think they were promoting like a 40 days for life event. They were promoting like going and praying outside Mm -hmm. of the place that I worked. And I was like, okay, well, this clearly isn't the church for me, right? And so um we ended up leaving and we had been very involved in that church for a long time, but we ended up leaving. Then we went to a non-denominational church. And as soon as they found out that, that I was working at Planned Parenthood, they were like, you, you can't come here. Um, which I don't think that's the right response either. I mean, 
you know, the right response is to say, we want to walk with you. We want to minister to you. We want to guide you through this. Right. Um, because at that time I'd already had an abortion. Like, I mean, there was, there were things going on in my life too, that led me into walk, you know, walking in the doors of Planned Parenthood. So, you know, ministering to that brokenness that was in me, that's what the church is supposed to do. Right. But instead they were like, well, you know, you work at Planned Parenthood, so you're not, we don't want you here. Um, so then we started looking for another church and we landed in the Episcopal church, which, uh, the Episcopal Church of America, for, for people that don't know, I mean, just the American Episcopal Church, is their, their heavy liturgy, no morals. So, uh, you know, you can go to a beautiful service and they will talk about the common good and they will talk about living well and, um, you know, they will talk about community and they'll talk about things that you go, yes, like I, yes, I want all of that in my life. Right. Um, but also their national doctrine is pro-abortion. Um, the person that actually, uh, confirmed Doug and I into the Episcopal church was a bishop, a female bishop who was a lesbian, um, and worked at, uh, a, a, an abortion uh, conglomerate. And so I was like, I fit in perfectly here, right? Like these are my people. Like I, this is, this is my thing, right? I I'm Episcopalian and this is it. This is going to be it for me. Um, but even then, I mean, once I saw what was really happening um, in the clinics, once, once the Lord really convicted me about it, um, that I saw an ultrasound guided abortion on a Saturday. Okay. And that was when we did surgical abortions. And so we did medication abortions every day of the week. We did surgical abortions on Saturday and that Sunday in that very, you know, I don't know, immoral environment, right? Uh, this place where, they are certainly not worshiping God. They are worshiping themselves. They're worshiping idols, right? They're worshiping um, choice and, you know, gay marriage and, and all these other things. In that service, though, God spoke to me very clearly and through the gospel, um, through his word. And, and I think that that is so true of the Lord, right? Is that we expect that God can only work under these conditions, right? Like God's only going to work under these specific parameters. But the, the reality in my life was that God caught up with me inside of an abortion clinic during the middle of, of an abortion procedure and then confirmed it for me in an Episcopal pro-choice pro LGBT church. And so, you know, God is, he's everywhere and he can move in your life anywhere at any point in time. And I tell people all the time, we can run from God. I mean, I was actively running from God. I hate when people say, oh, I, I fell out of my faith. Cause I'm like, no, you don't fall out of your faith. I mean, you, it's like when people say you fall pregnant, I'm like, I don't think that's how that works. But, um, I actively walked away from my faith, but because I had, as a child, made a commitment to the Lord to be his child and to love him and to serve him, he relentlessly pursued me, even during those times that I was walking away. And so even though I didn't really recognize it as like spiritual warfare or anything like that, I do look back over those eight years and see where God was constantly trying to open my eyes and mm -hmm. to say like, look at what you're doing, look at what you're participating in. Right. Um, but you know, the Bible says that, you know, before us will be life and death and we should choose life. And when you're working inside of an abortion clinic, there's many times where you're at that crossroad where you're like, okay, do I choose, do I choose righteousness or do I choose sinfulness? And every time you choose sinfulness, your heart becomes a little more hardened. And you become a little more calloused toward the Lord and toward, 
towards sin and you just continue to allow it into your life. I think that's such a key thing a lot of people are missing nowadays. It's so easy. I mean, whether you're working in an abortion clinic or you're just falling in with what the world's saying and doing when it comes to life, the LGBTQ, everything, it's so upside down right now. People don't realize, oh, if I just affirm this or get a little involved with this, that like you said, you're hardening your heart to the sin and the reality of what's going on. You did um, touch on that when you got to see that abortion happen, that's what was your kind of final call. Were there things leading up to that where you were like, okay, I'm kind of not happy with how this is going? Um, or was it just a one and done situation? Yeah, no, for sure. There were there were things that had happened. I mean, we were being told that we had to implement, you know, like abortion quotas in our facility and, you know, double our abortion number. And that was crazy to me because I just thought, wait a minute, I thought we were here to reduce the number of abortions. And now you're telling me I not only do I have to meet a quota, but now they wanted me to increase the quota that they had originally set. And I was just like, what? Like, I, and I'll be honest with you. I don't know how I was so blinded to it. You know, people are like, how did you not see it? You were there for so long. I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I think that sin can literally blind you to what's right in front of you sometimes. And I think that's what happened to me when I was there. I, you know, I mean, I was the one that was taking the bank deposits, you know, with $30,000 of cash in it. Like, of course we weren't trying to reduce abortion. Of course, this is about our money, right? Of course it was, but you just don't see it. And I think part of it is that you need to believe the lie. Mm -hmm. In order to continue what you're doing every day, you really need to believe that lie or else you have to face the truth. And the truth means that you may have to leave and, and leaving something that you're comfortable in, leaving something that has really become your identity. And it had become my identity at that point. You know, I didn't know who I was outside of being this pro-choice feminist. Mm -hmm. Um, confronting that is very scary. You know, having to say, I don't know who I'll be if I'm not this, that's that's very scary and it's overwhelming and that's why so many people stay locked in their sin because they are scared to just come out and confront it and to say whatever the cost is right whatever it is i'm i'm willing to take it however scary it is i'm i'm willing to stand up and do it absolutely and on the again kind of just becoming blind to the sin something i wanted to touch on you, in your movie, in your book, you touched on it, the POC room. Mm -hmm. Can we walk through, um, for those listening that have never heard or never don't know what that is, can we walk through what that is? Yeah. So um, in every abortion, at the end of the abortion, you there's a, a, a technician called a POC technician. POC stands for products of conception, which is, of course, the baby, but you can't say baby. <laughs> inside of an abortion clinic. So there was a POC technician inside of every abortion clinic. And, and her job was to take everything that was removed from the woman's uterus, put it into a, a glass baking dish, like a Pyrex dish. You'd put a little bit of water in the bottom and it's called floating the fetus. And so you just, the, the body parts just kind of float in the water and you, our, your job is to then piece them back together and to ensure that all of the parts have been removed from the woman's uterus. Because if we didn't, if we left, you know, a, a, an arm or the head or, you know, a leg or something in the womb, that woman could develop a very serious infection. She could become septic and that can be fatal for her. So, you know, there was this, but the POC in our lab, you know, Oh, it's, it's weird because the POC lab was kind of seen as like the holy of holies in the clinic. Mm. Like you don't really go in it, um, unless you're trained in POC and most people in the clinic don't want to go in it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see it. 
right? They're okay with abortion, like from the periphery. Mm -hmm. They're okay with counseling women for abortions. They're okay with taking the money. They're okay with making the appointments. They might even be okay, you know, uh, in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Writing down blood pressures or something. But the business end of abortion, dealing with the aborted babies, sifting through the tissue, all the blood, sterilizing all these bloody instruments, most people that work in the clinic are like, ah, uh, no, right? Like I'll just answer the phones. They don't want to deal with that. And so for you to be a person that works in the POC means that you're particularly tough. Mm -hmm. Like you're particularly committed to abortion. And I, you know, I wanted my boss to know that I was committed mm -hmm. to doing this job. And so when she asked me, do you want to come back into the POC lab? I was like, oh my gosh. Like, I remember thinking what an honor mm. that was for me that she would even ask me to go back there. And, uh, the first, the first baby I saw outside of the womb, uh, was a 12 week baby. And so everything was formed, everything's formed by 12 weeks and she had already kind of pieced it back together. So I could see that it was a, you know, a full body. And, you know, I remember looking at it and you would think that I would like vomit or something. I mean, you would think that I would be like, oh my gosh, like this is insane. But I just remember, this is how like demented my mind was at the time. I remember looking at this baby in the dish and thinking, wow, that's really miraculous. Mm -hmm. This is really a miracle that we go from this, right? This tiny human to who we are today. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying that out loud and my boss was like, yeah, it, it is really cool to, to get to do this part of the job. And I think because of my hardness of heart, because of my callousness, callousness, because I didn't start crying, because I didn't throw up, because I didn't run out of the room screaming or whatever. I remember my boss looking at me and saying, you didn't cry. And she said, you're the only person that I've ever brought back here that didn't cry. Mm. And she said, that's how I know you're the one. And I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, you're going to take over my job. You're going to do my job. Mm -hmm. And she was like, you're, you know, you're eventually, I think you're going to run this, this place. And I was like, wow, yeah. like, wow, amazing. What an amazing moment for me. We're having this conversation standing over this dead child's body. I mean, it's so macabre. It's so disgusting and gruesome and evil but when you're just living in that world every day when when death is just a part of your daily life um when child sacrifice is a part of your daily life when that that sort of demonic influence is hanging over you every day it really does become kind of a part of who you are and so i just remember feeling really really honored that she had said that to me instead of being like, uh, what does that say about me? Right? Like that I was the only person that looked at the body of a baby and didn't start crying. Like, what does that say about me? Mm -hmm. I felt like, man, that means I'm really tough. Right? Yeah. Like that means I really am meant to do this job. Yeah. And then, so you did eventually become that clinic director. How long was it between that day with her where she was like, I could see you running this place one day to the day where you were done and ran out? How many years were between that? You know, it was probably about, I was there a total of eight years. It was probably about six years um, because then I started actively working in POC Um you know, if my boss couldn't be there, she was the one that usually worked POC, but if she couldn't be there, she was handing it over to me and letting me do it. Um, which I thought was awesome. I thought that was a, a huge sort of promotion for me to be able to do this job that she had been doing forever. It was like coveted, sort of like this coveted position to kind of be her right hand person mm -hmm. in this death lab. Um, and so uh, it was about six years. It was six years 
before, you know, that first moment of seeing the baby in the dish and then actually seeing the ultrasound guided abortion and being like, I'm out of here. And I, and people ask me all the time, like, what was the difference? Like mm -hmm. you were seeing dead babies all the time. Like, why didn't that make you want to quit? Right. Why was it this, uh, this ultrasound guided abortion that made you want to leave. And I think the answer to that is that I, I was used to seeing babies in a state of death. I was used to seeing, they weren't babies to me. It was just tissue. It was just body parts. It was just nothing. Right. But, and I become really, uh, just desensitized to that. So, you know, when body parts would come in, even if it was later on a, a later term baby, I just wasn't moved by it because I think I had just been so desensitized. I think the difference was seeing the baby alive. Seeing, I was used to seeing the baby dead, right? Um, I was used to seeing it as just a thing, right? Not as a person. But to see on the ultrasound, to see this baby's heart beating, to see the instruments going toward its body, to see that heartbeat increasing, right? The heartbeat's beating faster. I can see that. And I can almost in that moment feel the panic mm. that that child had to have been feeling. And, and that is such a human condition, right? Like our feelings, the, the way that we process fear, all that kind of stuff. Like that's such a human condition. And so to see, oh my gosh, this 13 week old baby is trying to fight for its life. This 13 week old baby is trying to move away from these abortion instruments. That's literally the same thing that any of us would do if somebody was coming and threatening our lives with some sort of weapon, right? We would, we would instinctively try to protect ourselves. And that's what this baby was doing. And it just gave me such an awareness of the humanity of the child. I didn't see the humanity in the death, mm. um, in these body parts, but seeing that on that screen, that showed me the humanity of that child. And I think that's the perfect example of when people say it's just a fetus, it's just a clop of cells. Like they don't want to admit it has that humanity. And I think that's how we get caught up in this and how mm -hmm. the world gets caught up in, oh, it will, as long as we can remove that humanity. And I mean, thank God, God was like, I'm going to show you firsthand that humanity of that child. Um, and so that led to you basically immediately being done. And mm -hmm. now, um, cause people are like, okay, well you left now what? And so yes, you've been in the pro-life movement, but you're also now helping other, um, Planned Parenthood or abortion clinic workers now, if they leave, figure things out. And so what does that kind of look like? Yeah. So in 2012, I started an organization called, and then there were none. And, uh, we, you know, we just, we reach in, I mean, people say outreach, but we're really doing an in reach. I mean, we're reaching into these facilities and we're saying, look, we know this is not what you want to do. We know that this is not what you grew up wanting to do. You know, we knew that you, we know that you probably got involved believing that you were going to help women. Mm -hmm. And now look at what you're doing. And there is a way out. They feel very trapped though. Once they're in most of these women that work in abortion clinics are single moms. So they're making a salary that they probably couldn't make anywhere else. Mm -hmm. They're getting insurance benefits. They're getting all of these perks that they've never had before in their life. And so they start living a lifestyle that their salary can afford them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, and their children start getting accustomed to that and they get locked into a rent payment, right? That's more than what they could afford if they were working at Chick-fil-A or, you know, at Target. And so they get hooked into this lifestyle. And then once they see the evil of it, it's very hard for them to back out of it because they're like, how am I going to pay my rent? Like I, I can't get a job that's going to pay me this much money. And so they continue to cooperate in the evil 
just because of, of finances. And we were like, no, like that should never be a reason that your, your literal eternal soul is on the line for money. Like that should never be a reason. And so when we started it, you know, we didn't know how successful it would be, but, um, We've been at it now for 12 years and we have helped over 700 abortion workers leave the industry and come into a saving relationship with Christ because we know that that really is the only way that that these women and men, a few men, but that they can heal is, is really coming to an acknowledgement of their sins and then also coming to a place of complete repentance in the Lord. Wow. How amazing. Um, as we wrap up here, I always like to just end it with a final, if you have something on your heart, something we haven't talked about that you want to dive into or just advice for, um, a lot of the girls that are listening. So I just like to open it up for whatever you feel you want to share. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so much that can be said, said to young women. Um, but I think, I think that, you know, one of the things that I talk to young women all the time about is, um, the consequences of our actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was a lifestyle. I was living a lifestyle that brought me to the place where I had my first abortion Mm -hmm. that then brought me to a place where I worked at Planned Parenthood that then brought me to a place where I had a second abortion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then in the end I was, I helped facilitate over 22,000 abortions during my time there, but that didn't happen overnight. It was a a series of decisions that I made. And so I think to young women, I I talk to young women a lot and they'll say to me, you know, well, I just, I don't feel valued. I don't feel loved. And so that's why I feel like I need a boyfriend. That's why I feel like I need to have sex with my boyfriend. That's, um, and so I, I think for young women out there, you know, really spend time to find out who you are really spend time to figure out your identity, to recognize your value and your dignity and your identity in Christ. Um, Because I would have told you, you know, I'm a Christian, but I did not recognize my identity in Christ until I left Planned Parenthood. And so, you know, you don't want to be a person that the world tells you to be. You want to be the person that God tells you to be. And that might be very countercultural to, to, you know, today's society. I mean, standing up and being pro-life, standing up and being pro-traditional marriage, standing against, you know, all of these evil forces that are in our world, that today has become countercultural, but it's worth it. It's it's worth it to be countercultural because the reason we're doing it is for Christ and he gave up everything for us. And so we can stand up and take a little bit of persecution. We can take a little bit of ridicule. We can take a little bit of whatever is coming Mm -hmm. for us because we are doing the right thing and standing for Christ. But just really recognizing that identity in Christ and, and knowing who you are in him, I think is so important for young women to hear today. That's so good. Ladies that are listening right now, go rewind and listen to that again. I mean, you need to hear that twice. It's so good. So Abby, with that, what is the best way people can learn more about you, stay up to date with what you're doing and what your ministries are doing? Sure. So they can go to um, just my website, abbyj.com. And my podcast is there, um, my books, my ministries, everything is kind of, there's a bunch of resources there. Um, about all different types of topics. And so you can go there and that's kind of your one stop shop. Amazing. Well, Abby, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I know people are girls needed to hear this today. So thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Thank you so much.